from the Cube Studios in Palo Alto and Boston, bringing you data-driven insights from the Cube and ETR. This is Breaking Analysis with Dave Vellante. Enterprises are fighting a dual mandate of operating inside a tight IT budget envelope, while at the same time transforming their organization into an AI-first company. Balancing macroeconomic headwinds from inflation and uncertainty with driving innovation is an exciting challenge for IT decision makers. To deliver the goods, technology leaders are stealing from other budgets to fund AI. They're trying to find quick wins with pretty unspectacular use cases, and in some cases, swinging for the fences with ambitious AI training initiatives to drive revenue from things like advertising, of course, or complex examples like drug discovery with 10 year plus break even times. The reality is 16 months into the Gen AI awakening, there's lots of hype and tons of experimentation going on, but success in AI is far from assured. Hello and welcome to this week's The Q Research Insights powered by ETR. In this breaking analysis, we dig deep into the numbers and look at the macro spending climate. Then we go into specific spending patterns around generative AI. We're gonna look at how budgets are being funded, how Gen AI ROI expectations are shifting. We're gonna look at some common use cases and the adoption of some of the more popular LLMs. And we're gonna close by asking the somewhat controversial and sometimes annoying question, is it cheaper to do AI in the cloud or on-prem? First, let's look at how the sentiment on IT spending has changed in just a few short months. This chart shows the results of 12 quarters of sampling ETR survey data, IT decision makers and their forecasts of their annual tech spending growth. The ends on these surveys consistently range between 1,500 and 1,800 with very high overlap, around 75% of repeat respondents. So as we, you can see in the upper left, as we exited COVID and the Fed started tightening, expectations kept decelerating and finally bottomed when the Fed stopped tightening last summer. Rob Williams, who's the Senior Vice President of Investor Relations at Dell, commented to me on this chart that this probably tracks the two-year Treasury yield. And he's absolutely right. It's basically inversely proportional to that metric, meaning the rise in two-year yields corresponds to a deceleration in IT spend expectations. And what's notable in this data is IT spending grew at about 3.4% last year. And in the January survey, decision makers expected it to jump to 4.3%, but as we cautioned at the time, the quarterly growth expectations were very much backloaded. Well, sure enough, if you track the, 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 the two year, it's popped up again lately as the higher for longer theme reared its head. And as you see in the red here, the expectations have dropped from 4.3% growth, that was January to 3.4% in the April survey with Q1 and Q2 forecasts also decelerating. So. We would expect IT spending to grow at at least one, perhaps two points faster than GDP. With the new CPI numbers out, we could see GDP forecast uh, and growth expectations growing, but it looks like right now they're coming together with these tech spending forecasts. And with the AI mandate, you would certainly like to see tech spending maintain that one and a half, two point gap. But the reality is while AI hype is in full swing, AI monetization isn't. And so the Fed remains a factor, it seems. So given the tight macro, how is AI being funded? And as we've indicated in previous episodes, this data shows us that 42% of customers in a survey uh, of 898 respondents say they're stealing from other budgets. And when we dig into that data, the money is coming from business apps, non-IT departments, productivity apps, no surprise there that Gen AI could disrupt, other IT spending, like kind of legacy machine learning, analytics, and not surprisingly, legacy RPA. Now remember, this data represents percent of customers, not budget amount. But when you look at the big spenders in large companies, the figure jumps 50%. This data shows the results from 224 global 2000 respondents in the survey. So at more than 10% of the G2000, it's pretty representative set of respondents. The point is, because of the macro climate and perhaps other factors that we're going to discuss, it's not like the CFOs are, 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 are across the board opening their checkbooks. Now, anecdotally, I will tell you that some CFOs are being very aggressive 
about AI spending. But again, it's not across the board. I'll be excited to look back five to seven years from now to see those uh, aggressive companies, those ones that are spending aggressively on AI and those forward-thinking CFOs. I want to look back and see how they're faring. The other thing to note is ROI expectations are becoming somewhat less aggressive. People naturally listen to the hype and they think, oh, this AI stuff is easy, which in many cases it is, but it's not as easy to drive measure results, measurable results to the point where you can throw off enough cash to fund, to gain share and fund future investments. Not yet anyway. So ROI expectations are shifting to the right as shown on this chart, meaning they're becoming less aggressive. Still inside of 12 months, but as you see, there's also uncertainty on ROI timelines in the far right there. The other thing we see is ITDMs, IT decision makers, they're squirreling away some of this budget and waiting as they try to determine where to place their bets. But as the call out notes, the big spenders at large companies are even more conservative as shown here. And look, why not? Why sign up for a short ROI when you're still experimenting with Gen AI? and basically applying chat GPT-like use cases to your business. For example, this data that we showed here tracks how Gen AI is being used in 1,800 accounts. And in no, in no way is this remarkable by any means. What you'd expect, right? Tech summarization is the most popular, and followed by customer chat support, and then code generation and writing marketing copy. There's some image editing and design work, which is becoming more functional, and, you know, it's got a low single digits of other, which includes some of those more complex use cases, like the ones we mentioned up front. Advertising to drive revenue and things like drug discovery. Now, these use cases are expensive and they're very training intensive and require access to GPUs, which either you're going to get from cloud providers or those alternative GPU clouds, like we've talked about in the past, like CoreWeave or Genesis or Lambda. Or you're going to buy GPUs and do the work on-prem. But if you're not willing to commit to spending $10 million, there's a good chance you're not going to see an NVIDIA GPU for a long time unless you buy it from an OEM. So the clouds are an option. Or increasingly, if you're going to, if you're going to go to the Dells and HPEs of the world to buy GPU-powered servers, you're going to you know, increasingly have access to those. Now, the other call-out on this data is look to the left. We've highlighted the red in red the percent of customers not evaluating Gen AI and LLMs. You might say, huh? Now that's what I said when I first saw the data. And while the number has come down quite significantly, in looking into this, we confirm this is actually the case. These respondents said, oh, no, we're not pursuing Gen AI. And it's not necessarily that there's no Gen AI happening in the company, there probably is, but there are a number of folks that we talk to that say, Look, it's, it's moving too fast right now. It's too complicated to pick winners. So we're going to wait. We're going to step back, let the storm subside, and then we're going to pick up the pieces by learning from others. Now, the other thing we heard from these folks is shown in the insert that people just don't trust the models right now. They elucidate too much, and they're too risky given the edicts for compliance and govern governance in the organization. You know... To both of these, we'd say, at the very least, you need to start thinking about your AI platform architecture. It's going to be very different from the way you support your general purpose workloads of CRM and ERP and collaboration software today, even if that's in the cloud. So we advise thinking about your AI platform and how to construct that. Look, you're likely a hybrid shop today, so how do you evolve that into so-called hybrid AI with a combination of cloud and on-prem? And how are you rethinking your data strategy to support AI by things like unifying metadata or rationalizing disparate data types with semantic layers and so forth? Things are moving so fast. Here's some data from ETR on AI tools adoption. It shows for each AI vendor, the percent of customers in the latest survey adopting the platform new, that's the dark blue in the top of the bar, Investing spend, um, investing more spending in the let's the light blue, the second layer of the bar, spending flat, which is that powder blue, spending less than you did the previous year. That's the orange and churning, departing from the platform. That's in the red. You subtract the orange and the red from the darker and the lighter blues, 
and you get net score, which is that dark blue line you see going down to the right, you go from left to right with the number of vendors there. Now, what this data is telling us is that OpenAI and Microsoft are, they're like the iPhone and AT&T in the early days with a partnership that's getting a lot of attention and frankly, working. Anthropic has made a big move up recently in the last few months in our surveys, in ETR surveys, to surpass Llama in spending velocity. Cohere, you see, has momentum. Amazon SageMaker are still very popular for a lot of AI applications that Gen AI is not really well suited for. We talked about that last week on Breaking Analysis. Google, interestingly, is closing the gap on AWS. When you look at Google's spending momentum, they still don't have as big a presence in the cloud, but their spending momentum is, is closing the gap on AWS. AWS, a lot of AWS's activity is probably through bedrock, so some anthropic is well, certainly through AWS. Databricks here is, is very likely their legacy ML, actually you know, highly likely, and that's doing very well. It's not DBRX, which they just announced. That's not in these numbers. Hugging Face is also very popular. Uh, and then you see the pre-chat GPT firms like H2O and others, you know, they're, they're having to evolve their portfolios. Now, IBM is interesting here to us because for the first time in a long time, we're really excited about you know, IBM and the prospects and how the company, Arvind Krishna, really has the company on the right track in our view. The data is not as friendly here, though. Uh, we suspect it's because IBM is still cycling through the old legacy Watson, which was positioned in places that you know really shouldn't have been. It was very largely services led, but they're ramping up Watson X and its corresponding services around Watson X for data and Watson X for governance, et cetera. But IBM is definitely in the game, as is Oracle, which is not shown on this particular chart. And look, we sympathize with the complexity of the situation right now. As an example, Databricks announced DBRX touting benchmarks of a, uh, an MOE a mixture of experts model that beats Mixtral, who popularized that methodology. Then Mixtral counters like days later with a new high watermark. And then Amazon ups its investments in Anthropic, but they're building Olympus, which they want, that's their supposedly code name for their internal LLM, uh, which, you know, which, which goes beyond their existing uh, uh, LLM. And they want that to be better than Claude, which is Anthropic's uh, LLM. That's what the reports are anyway. Then Microsoft does an ac AccuHire of inflection AI. So yeah, it's complicated. And you got open source and you have closed source. And so there's a lot of FUD going around. By the way, to prepare us uh, it, uh, to think about architectures that serve your business. So that's really what we're thinking here is you want to build your architecture that fits your needs. And that may mean focusing primarily on the processes and the people versus the technology, which is fine. But the folks that are telling us, wow, it's just moving too fast, you can still start with, okay, how should we be rethinking our organization? What does this mean for our processes? The, the technology, the underlying technology, arc, at some point is you're going to figure that out and how to leverage that. But think about the architecture of your business so you can, you can compete. And you want to think about that now and bringing in the expertise and partnerships to help you build that for your purposes. Now, the last thing we're going to talk about is cost of cloud versus on-prem. And everyone's debating this. It's kind of obnoxious because the answer is always, it depends. That's the answer you're going to get from us today. The cloud platforms are moving very fast. And let's face it, that's where most of the monetization action is right now with Microsoft pulling off the open AI coup. And they've forced Google and AWS to respond with their internal code reds. And as you see the GPU clouds that we talked about earlier popping up and Meta throwing off its open source weight around with Llama and the hyperscalers, you know, they're winning the CapEx wars because they're swimming in cash. And so they're buying as many GPUs as they possibly can. And at the same time, they're building their own silicon chips. But then you see at, at GTC, NVIDIA's conference, there's Michael Dell sitting in the first row getting a call out from Jensen Jensen says, nobody's better at building end-to-end -end systems than Dell, so you want an AI end-to-end -end system, go to Dell. He'll take your order. Right in the first row was amazing. And it's true, because Dell has by far the most comprehensive end-to-end -end portfolio of anyone from laptops to high-end servers. But how do you think HPE, Lenovo, and Supermicro feel about that call-out? So HPE just announced that Jensen is going to be speaking at the Sphere with Antonio Neri at HPE Discover. 
Now, the reason I bring this all up is, is adding to the confusion, the cloud players are saying, come to us. We have optionality, we have tools, we have our own LOMs, we got a partnership with OpenAI, we got innovation, we have scale, come to us. The alternative GPU cloud guys are saying, no, no, don't go, don't go to the clouds. They're not built for the AI era. They're built for general purpose computing. They're all about multi-tenant. You know, AI is different. And then the on-prem uh, crowd is saying, you're going to spend a lot of money in that cloud, so come over to us. So we got a hold of some data that we found interesting. It's data from a study commissioned by Dell and conducted by ESG. Now you have to be warned, this was paid for, a paid for study. And you know how these things are, they're going to be used in marketing. But the person who led the study, his name is Aviv Kaufman. He's very well respected. And from what I'm told, and by the way, I was not told this by Dell. I didn't even bother asking Dell that. But I know a lot of people who know this individual who said he would not compromise his ethics and very proud of, of building models that show, you know, fair, that are fair and defensible. And this guy went to WPI. He's got a strong engineering background and, and worked in labs in the past. So let's give him the benefit of the doubt. Now, cutting to the chase, just to add a little more FUD into the conversation, this data shows that doing inference on-prem for a $70 billion, sorry, 70 billion parameter Llama 2 LOM using RAG is far cheaper on-prem than in the cloud. And the point of the study is if you're driving your RAG via token-based API services from the likes of OpenAPI, you're going to pay a price over doing your own RAG on-prem with open source models. And RAG, let's face it, RAG's not that hard to do. We, we've done it. It's hard to get right. It's hard to necessarily monetize. But this data suggests that doing RAG-based workloads with Dell-powered GPU servers is more cost-effective than using IS on AWS or other clouds. Now, I love the ping pong matches, whether it's benchmarking or these TCO studies. So the first thing AWS is going to say to this as well, if you want lower cost inference, and I think the study was using NVIDIA GPUs, I think they would say, well, you should use our custom inferentia chips. You can only get them in our cloud. And I'm not sure this Dell study did that. I don't think the Dell study used that, but trying to do an apples to apples with NVIDIA chips. So <laughs> hence the, 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 the methodology becomes really, really important, but, but that's what this back and forth is all about. The point is, this is one of those it depends moments. Cloud company A is gonna tell you it's much less expensive to do IT in the cloud than on-prem with all that heavy lifting. And the on-prem guys will say, well, that may have been true in 2010, but we replicated the cloud operating model on-prem. And it's a hybrid world. And so the debate goes on. It is a hybrid world, by the way. Now, it may very well be more expensive sometimes to do work in the cloud, but oftentimes the developers in an organization are so in love with their cloud that nothing you can do. It's almost worth that extra cost because of the disrupt, potential disruption. And if you try to force them to go back on-prem with certain workloads, or there's access to new services or innovation in the cloud that are often better. At the same time, as we all know, cloud bills a lot of times opaque, they're oftentimes very expensive, they're unpredictable, hence that's why we saw all this cloud optimization the last couple of years. And moreover, the data you want to use for your AI may not be in the cloud. So in all likelihood, well, the cloud is gonna continue to grow faster than on-prem, and that's where a lot of the AI, if not most of the AI action is today. A lot of customers, most customers, they're living in a hybrid IT environment, and that is going to extend to hybrid AI. But I'd like to speak with Aviv and learn more about this study, so I'm going to reach out to him and hope he talks to me. Okay, we got to wrap, but let's leave with a few thoughts on some of the things that we're paying attention to and some of the barometers that you can look at around enterprise IT adoption. Now, despite all the confusion, one thing is clear. The big money in AI right now is in consumer, and it's in super chips, and big memories, and fast interconnects, and training. And B2C use cases they're like no-brainers for it for AI because the bigger the AI cluster that these internet giants can build, the better AI and ad targeting that they're going to get. So they're literally printing money. But those big complex problems in healthcare and climate and the like, they have very long investment horizons and are going to take a long time to pay back. So they may not see ROI for a decade. Mainstream enterprises 
uh, mainstream enterprise use cases are focused on productivity and quick hits that are very chat GPT-ish in nature, quite frankly, document summarization, and ideation, code generation, et cetera. RAG, as we said, is not that hard to do and it allows for domain specificity, domain specific inferencing. There are a lot of experiments going on with RAG today, but the big money use cases, they're not that easy to find. They're, RAGs are fun, they're cool, the, the chat GPT like stuff is, is really you know, catching a lot of attention, but down the road, when you really start driving this into your business, cost is gonna be a factor. We think low cost inferencing at the edge is gonna be the dominant AI use case. Now, it's not necessarily gonna create monopolies. In total, it's probably gonna be a bigger market, but capitalizing on that for one company is gonna be a little bit more difficult. It's gonna be much more uh, uh, distributed and, and, and narrow uh, examples. You're, not gonna like, you're likely not gonna see an NVIDIA-like monopoly and NVIDIA does have a monopoly, by the way. You're not going to see that emerge at the edge. The question about NVIDIA is how long can it hold that monopoly? We'll come back to that, but in some other day. But there's going to be a lot of inferencing at the edge. That's the point. And collectively, it's going to drive a lot of revenue, big opportunities, and particularly opportunities for consumers of AI to really drive differentiation in their business. And as we've said for years, it's going to be based, most of it is going to be based on the ARM standard. Now, finally, forward-thinking CTOs and this emerging role of what we'll call an AI architect, they're thinking about their new platform strategy. The waiting for the storm to clear and subside may not be the best strategy with respect to architecture. There are some knowns, like the type of workload patterns AI requires and how training and inference work may have different requirements. And much of this is about governance. It's certainly about your data and your data quality. That's where you're going to get your differentiation and your competitive advantage. And of course, it's about other corporate edicts that you have to comply to. And cost is going to come into play, it always does. Look, remember the math and ROI, it's really simple. It's benefit divided by cost. So we all know what happens when you drive the denominator towards zero. The result goes to infinity. But the size of the benefit matters too. So for instance, a thousand percent ROI on a project with a $100 net present value is it nearly as interesting as a 12% IRR on a billion dollar net present value? But if it takes 10 years to get payback and that, that crossover, you know, a lot can change in 10 years. Huh. Confused about what to do with AI? Well, you're not alone. So think about the people effects and the dramatic changes in your business process that AI can bring. Then get going on architecture, platforms, iterative development and learnings from the experiments that you're running today. But don't stick your head in the sand and hope to figure it out down the road or your company may be out of business. Okay, that's it for now. What do you think? Does this data we shared reflect what's happening at your organization? Do you have it all figured out or are you struggling to keep up? Where are you placing your AI bets and how are you funding them? Let us know. Okay, thanks to Alex Meyerson and Ken Schiffman on production. And Alex does our podcast. Kristen Martin and Cheryl Knight help get the word out on social media and in our newsletters and Rob Hoth is our EIC over at siliconangle.com. Remember, all these episodes are available as podcasts wherever you listen. Just search Breaking Analysis Podcasts. I publish each week on theqresearch.com and siliconangle.com. You can email me. Want to get in touch, david.vellante at siliconangle.com or DM me at dvellante or comment on a LinkedIn post. Please do check out etr.ai for the best survey data in the enterprise tech business. This is Dave Vellante for the Q Research Insights powered by ETR. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time on Breaking Analysis.